About 12 years ago, I could see modern style, the trend of modern style start to gain traction and be more popular. And, and you could see that was coming. And we were doing a lot of timber framing at the time with more rustic styles. And I got kind of worried. I was really nervous that if this style continues, is it going to put me out of business? That's where my head was at. Since then, the modern style has actually become, oops, where's my pen here? This style right here, modern, is number two for me. This one's number one. That's my second favorite. Hi, I'm Bert Sarkinen, owner of Aero Timber Framer and author of The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. And I'm glad you're with me today. Thanks for being here. So we're gonna really dig into what's going on between these two. You're gonna see differences and we're going to, you might grab a pen and a notebook because we're gonna give some introspective questions, kind of get some things moving around inside your head and see what of modern you like, what of rustic you like. You might be thinking to combine some, some options. We see that a lot today. And so that's what we're gonna get into. So here we go. Here's your overview. We're gonna talk about general characteristics. So this is gonna be a little bit like a college class or something. We're gonna have a lot of information because right at the beginning, we're all fresh, right? We're gonna talk about trade-off decisions. Here's where you're gonna have a little introspection about trade-offs between modern and rustic and maybe see and learn something about yourself you didn't know or confirm something you already kind of had a good idea about. Then we've got some case studies. We're just gonna show you kind of how styles evolve and just some, some before and afters. It's just some cool ideas and we'll dig into more details in this. We're gonna take some of these general characteristics and we'll try to bring them back to the breakdown. And then we've got some more introspection for you with determining your preference. And of course, we've got a live bonus for the live viewers at the end and a follow-up Q&A. With the Q&A, here's some pre-loaded questions we have for you. So what if my style is different from my spouse's? What if I'm all over the map with my style? How do I know which style is best for me? There's a lot of questions here. We're gonna go through these, but if you've got questions, put them in the chat bar. Lucas is here operating. He may chime in if I'm missing some details that are important information that we want to get to you today. But if you've got questions, send them in because we'll handle those as well. Provided we have time, which we've got a little extra time today, so we expect questions. Okay, so we're moving right into buzzwords. So this is looking at rustic and modern, kind of in a bigger perspective. And you're gonna see like this here with modern, you've got a lot of style labels, if you will, names, industrial, contemporary, mid-century, modern, your vintage, Scandinavian, minimalist, terms that are in the designer and architect's world. And then for Lodge, it's a little bit more intuitive, kind of from the gut, that, that we all have, you know, Lodge, Mountain, Chalet, Log or Organic, Western, Ranch, or even Homestead. That, that Homestead kind of calls back to pioneer days and getting something up for survival. And, and so that's, of course, going to be less refined and more rustic. That is kind of the bigger picture. So moving down, characteristics. So on when we're what, from, from the labels, now we're moving to characteristics. With rustic, steep roofs, not always, <clears throat> especially like when you're talking Western, you might not have a steep roof, but, but with lodges and different things, steep roof is dumping snow, big overhangs for protection, which is, which is usually with, Western as well as Lodge, the elements in the rain, rugged finishes, large, sprawling, high ceilings, vaulted, 
uh, natural materials. And then with modern, you got a lot, you got a lot bigger spectrum here, but you're going to be looking at a lot of blocky shapes, clean lines, shed roofs, the single slope roofs, a lot of times in juxtaposition, different, different directions, a lot of glass. And sparse in that, you know, in your mind's eye, you can probably picture art on the walls or statue and lots of space, not too many knickknacks, uh, that sort of thing. And one thing that with modern, you know, we talked contemporary before, modern, in my mind, one of the hallmarks that will never change with modern is surprise twist. Modern is probably the category that is the fastest growing and fastest evolving because it's on the cutting edge. It's, it's always gonna be changing faster. So the surprise use of materials and colors and textures, that's, and, and I'll, we'll share some, some, how that works with timbers with some little surprise twists as well. But that's kind of the hallmark of modern in, in, my, in my head. Now, if we break it down to just timbers, we're just going to zero in on the timbers. So rustic, big, obviously, and lots of it. Rough detailing, not too ornate, not too refined. You might have hand hewn or a circle sawn or even a light rough sawn. Rugged pegs, sometimes you'll see pegs in a, in a beam where the peg comes way out, there's a hand-driven peg and one's you know shorter than the other and they might hang a canteen off of it. That is kind of, you really got a lot of, you know, rustic thing like that. That's, that's all. Uh, one thing that I don't have on here is like heavy metal, here we go, heavy metal work. Sometimes it's rusted metal work. Uh, that, again, all, all in the rustic here. Um, just in case you take notes, I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, then with modern, the timbers are going to be generally smaller, unless there's something focal or a big span. But in general, the timbers are going to be smaller. Timbers are going to be smaller. Uh, curves, we've done it with modern here and there. In general, angular, sharp. Precise, crisp might be another word you'd associate with modern. Uh, the detailing, non-existent. You know, it's just like, this is Spartan. You know, we talked about spacing. So by sparse timbers, we mean spacing. It's not going to be four foot on center. Chunk, 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 chunk. None of that. What, what timbers are going to be there are going to be have space to breathe, just like the space of modern itself. And you, you'll see it there. I mean, it's going to going to have an impact. Airy and light, a term that goes modern, smooth, and sleek, and we'll touch back on that later as well. Okay, next we're going to go into a continuum. So trade-off continuums, and I've got an example for you here. So let's just say that you were going to buy a truck. Not that you are, but just that you were so here's how a continuum works. You've got on one end, you've got slow hauling and then fast commuting. And so a dump truck, of course, would be, you know, way over here, or a semi, not gonna run to the convenience store for a pack of cigs or anything, 10 o'clock at night with a dump truck, unless that's the only uh, vehicle you have. So in this example, we've started by circling fast, commu fast commuting, and then, you know, we have a why. I need to haul stuff from time to time, so a one-ton truck is a good choice. Fair enough. And it puts, you know, a two, maybe a, a one on the scale, starting with zero in the middle. And then the, the thing with trade-offs, and the thing that makes trade-offs so hard, is what we have to say no to. And if we can be clear about what we're saying no to, it makes it a lot easier. So what are you saying no to? No capacity for bigger loads, no to good fuel economy. You're still not going to get great fuel economy with a, a one ton. 
It's going to cost a bit, so no to a less expensive vehicle, no to easy parking in tight parking lots, and just easy driving in general, right? So if you're clear about that, and you say, yeah, I'm down with that. One time's still good. And it's boom, your decision's done. You don't have to waffle and wonder. So now we're going to you. Here we go. Okay, look clean and spartan, robust and warm. Which one of these, if you had to take one or the other, you couldn't be in the middle, you had to be here or here. I'm not saying you have to be there. Choose this first. Which one are you going to choose? If you have to be very clean and spartan or very robust and warm, what one will you choose? What resonates with you? Just take a moment and make that decision. Once that decision is made, now you can move that anywhere in the spectrum. But the reason to do that is when push comes to shove, when you're making decisions and the building process, not only with the timbers, you'll be able to, even if you're here, for example, at you know just slightly more Spartan, even if you're there and you know that it's, it's lodged in your mind, you're going to have an easier time with decisions on how much timber, what kind of light. There's, there's just a gazillion choices and decisions you're going to have to make. And being aware of what's what and what you're saying no to is a wonderful thing. Big help. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing for the others. The why and the, what you're saying no to, that's for you to do on your own. But here's another another continuum. Light and minimal versus big and rugged. Again, if you have to go one or the other, which one is it? And then even before selecting your, your refined choice, you can answer why and what you're saying no to. That, that's up to you. But light and minimal, big and rugged, what are you? And the last one here, Stout and primal versus surprising and edgy. What is it? Again, think if you had to make a choice, one or the other, which one is it going to be? Okay. And you can circle back to those with your notes and do some more introspecting later. Okay, so we've got a project here. We're gonna, this one is a rustic project. We're gonna run through the rustic ones first. And here's this, so I'm gonna cover kind of a lot for you here. One of the things is as you're doing your planning and moving forward with acquiring your timber frame or whatever project you're gonna do, and it's not just building projects, even if you're gonna buy shoes, the same learning curve, applies, but it's more complicated, the more complicated your project or, or acquisition or goal, whatever it is. So say that you're building, you might come, you might start with this. Figure out, yeah, that's kind of what you're looking for, but it's going to transition. It's going to move. It'll, it'll move here. Then, you know, then it moves into something uh, you, you end up, it, it transitions. So there's a saying from an old Prussian general that states, no battle plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. Not that your goals are your enemy, but you get the idea. And so that if that evolution, that as more information comes in, you're going to be able to make better decisions. And so knowing what you're about, what you're going to say no to, those continuums we talked about, what you're going to say no to is really going to help you with those decisions. And we do have exercises in the book, in the second edition coming up, and also in the first edition, which isn't available now. We've got a second edition. It's so much better. We just stopped the first edition. It's just great. But the sections one, the, for the visionary, the owner, the person driving the project, we've got exercises in there similar to the continuum that really can get you understanding what is your home base? Where should, where should you be making your decisions from? Okay, 
So let's talk about their rustic here. This is a hybrid package. I'm gonna go back one here. Okay, so this was this here was an attempt of working with flow and massing and really getting something. So this as you can see there's no timbers, it's still kind of preliminary. And one of the things that happens a lot is we'll see kind of this big space that has no flow and like this this garage here in this example it kind of dominates in some way especially from the other angle if if you can kind of have a you know a mass it kind of flows to another with your central massing and that in general it, it, there's something pleasing about it and some people i've tried to apply golden ratios to it i've tried a lot of different things and and in the end, I can only say that quantity, just keep going through the ideas and eventually things start to coalesce and resonate and feel good. But the massing principle of the kind of some sort of flow, that's that's where that went. And then we still kept that flow with this one here. You'll see that we got the, the, big, the big mass here. And, it, and it's some, some, of course we, we made sure that we had the timbers above here to give you that visual focus. And then the garage gets it bigger, but we have a little separation to where it's not right there trying to steal the show. And then there's, you know, this is granny flats here, your place for, for elderly parents or something to live in this particular example. So that's kind of a bigger, bigger context of, you know, getting the big picture bright, just in general flow and beauty. So let's talk about the rustic here, the rustic thing. You see the timbers are big. There's a lot of them. We do have some curves, which is going to bring in elegance. Uh, we don't have, and this is something that's kind of just a little bit of a preference of mine. I very rarely, if you can see here, let's see if I can bring this in here for you. You see here in this great room, we don't have we don't have timbers every four foot, you know, stuck timbers in here and and wood on the ceiling and really try to back that off and find a sweet spot. When I see just a bunch of wood thrown up in a ceiling and just all over the place, it really reminds me of when I was a kid. I got my first car or truck and start adding mags into the wheels and then pretty soon you got a little gizzy on the you know, around the windows and then a blower on the hood and pretty soon it's so pimped out that it's just kind of too much and that's really we we get there with our timber designs we we push it to this point well we've got enough experience we don't go that far but we try ideas and you know we're really cognizant of when to back off you know that hey no even though It'd be an RS interest to sell more wood. If it's not, it's not good for the long term. So, so back it off and make it right. Um, but the the timber is more dense. Is is a hallmark of is a hallmark of rustic. Let's see here. Oop, okay, let's go a hundred here. Good enough. One thing with rustic you'll see, and that's stone, the stone bases. That does a lot to add a robust feel. And it was practical too, and is practical. In other words, the rain and the sun are going to hit the lower parts of the post the most. So if we can get big overhangs and then get some stone, you know, we're going to have a long lasting structure. That's what has been true through the ages and still continues on to this day. It's kind of part of the style and, and, it, and it's practical as well. So what else do we see about rustic here? The stone is a big contributor. You've got corbels underneath there. These are big pieces of wood. This is a big house. This is 10,000 square feet. So the timbers might look, they, they look right, but if you were to have these on a sours and be working on them, you would do like I do all the time and say, huh, isn't that too big? 
it's just incredibly big, scary big. But I've learned to calm my heart and follow the process. Okay. Here's another project that is indeed rustic. Do, do, do. So, of course, you can't, you'll, you've probably seen the pictures. It's on the front cover of the book, the big cedar logs. With this particular plan, it's really interesting because we got the plan and I really worked a lot in our model. This is, this is what we started with. Work with the designer. They give us the kind of the preliminary and then we go to town tweaking things to make things best for the timbers. And I don't remember just specifically where we were at, but I do remember that I was trying to minimize the entry a little bit because it was so tall and the timbers in the rest of the place trying to make it consistent with what we had going on elsewhere. And then halfway through the design, the owners, the owner logging company, they found these beautiful cedar logs. And so then I had to reverse, reverse the process and everything was on a much bigger scale. So then everything changed and it was a lot of things happened to make it all fit, but but uh, the big logs, of course, set a tone. I mean, now once you got that, you've got to have timbers that are really robust. Even the corbels over here, they're 10 inches wide and thick, chunky things. Uh, and on the inside, they've got wood ceilings, not wood walls, and the floors, some wood floors. But again, there's there's stone. You're going to see a lot of stone and wood together in rustic style. And if we just, uh, uh, just a kind of a little aside, when we've got these double posts like this, when they're really big, they can fit with rustic. But when you get double posts, the, just the fact that it's double is going to put it towards craftsman or classic a little bit. And so that's just a little aside. And your style is going to mix and match, and you're going to find what's great for you. But uh, big always goes to rust. Again, so here you are. Big logs, big log posts. It's not for the faint of heart to cut them to size, I can tell you that. Nobody would do it. Top guy in the shop. <laughs> no, Bert, you have to cut them. And so nobody wanted that responsibility. So eventually, check, 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 and fire up the chainsaw and you only check so many times before, hey, you just got to make some dust, right? But when, when that was done, everything had been fit, the tops cut, and I was cutting down here. So it's just kind of, I mean, what do you do if you blow that, right? Okay, so we're going to go to modern. So this is a project in Idaho. It's currently underway. Really uh, had a lot of fun with this. This is a remodel. So there's a lot of, with remodel, you get a lot of, a more chance to be creative because you have so many more constraints. Creativity, contrary to popular belief, I've heard this and I've experienced it. This is where I'm at. Creativity is, gets, greater the more constraints you have. If you start off with a blank sheet of paper and you have to design your home, say, and you have kind of nothing to start with, there's just all these things, you got to start, and this is a great thing for saying no, you know, it'll enhance your creativity. But because if there's so many things, it's like, there's just no traction. It's all kind of just a slurry and it's, there's no moving forward. But when you've got, hey, you've got a chimney, for example, that can't come down because of sentimental value or it's in good shape and blah, 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 whatever. You have to design around that. Or say, for example, you've got uh, setbacks or you can't change the footprint of the building, but you need to move walls and change it to where it's a living style that fits and captures so, so such and such a vibe. All of this, it, it, it's challenging. Don't get me wrong, and it's work, but your creativity shoots up. 
That's just kind of how it works. So this is a remodel. And, you know, we had to kind of figure out something that really resonated here. The, and, and it's funny, this it's is really weird. So here's, here's kind of the, the modern, see these posts kind of coming like this. I mean, who does that, right? But it kind of flows, it sets with that roof that's a little cocked. It gives some visual interest. It, let me zoom that in for you here. And uh, I don't know, there's just, we, we tried a lot of different things with this and, and it that's kind of what worked. We There was uh, another one that had a roof here that sloped up, but it didn't fit the, we, the deck. We, we just really try a lot of things when we're doing this. But uh, the post on the end, we tried to do just a post on the end angle, but but still something in something in us still kind of wants borders. We want familiarity, but we, and we want something different. We want something cool, but not too cool, if you know what I mean. We don't want to get just way out there. And so that still felt like it was kind of coloring between the lines to a degree, but getting playful. And this is what resonated with the owners. We did get the, the pieces here on the shop that uh, is really close. It's really created a challenge with marrying all this up. And, uh, but it came together. I mean, and again, it's, it's that forced creativity that's just really rewarding. Um, so I'm going to show you the back now. Let me get this back too close. So here's the back. In the back, we actually had to work at quite a while. They wanted something that was similar to the front. We had a, a different concept for the back, <clears throat> but, uh, and they're big overhangs. So you got some structural considerations here too. But this here really worked out. I first thought of going all the way up, just pulling that. But that kind of was funky and hey, why don't we just shorten it? And it sounds awful simple right now, but you know, these things come with like pulling teeth. You have to really work at it. So this is something that it, it, this right here follows kind of some of the back. We brought these, these knee braces down to kind of follow that vibe that they really felt like they liked. And again, this is that modern, it's not too big. You look at how big that, how big the structure is, and these timbers aren't huge, and they're pretty sparse. Uh, over here, here's another little surprise twist with this right here. This post comes up and bends over and then wides. So that's kind of a cool, it goes straight to where the railing hits, and then it, it actually forks. So that's something that you don't see a lot of, and it's uh, just part of that excuse me, part of that modern modern surprise. And lighter, there's not a lot of detailing. If we go back to the front one here. We're not putting timbers in real close proximity. There's no wood ceilings. Or if they are wood, we suggest that they get kind of a whitewash, which is where you get a color like a, light, a white or a gray, but it's, it's semi-transparent, so you can still kind of still see it's wood, but it's not the log cabin, like wood everywhere. Okay, so here's another project that here again was our starter and modern. And this is a typical shed roof or a typical hip roof. And we proposed a, a shed roof running back. So it kind of opens up and invites you in with a little box beam here. Um, here's a little bit of rustic in that there's a stone it's going down to where the post is form fit to a stone. Uh, one of the things that we did here was lowered these two roofs. And this is a bigger contextual thing, whether well, no matter what style you're looking at, you're looking for shapes and golden ratios. But but the big thing here with the modern is 
that surprised it with a roof going back. Yeah, there's a cricket in back and there's some trade-offs to be sure. You've got to really be careful with how we get that water out of the back and the cricket. But for the for that welcome and uh, that modern kind of vibe, you know, we kind of felt like it was worth it and the owners agreed. In this particular one, you'll see there's quite a few timbers going back, which kind of goes against what I just said a bit ago. These are smaller and they're up on the ceiling and it, it uh, you're not gonna have a lot of timbers in another place. So it's kind of just that compacted impact just right here, that's where it's at. And that's one of the things that I really like about modern style. One of the reasons it's my second favorite is you do get so much more latitude to work with zany ideas that are kind of silly at first, but then you bring them back and and they can be a lot of fun. And speaking of zany ideas, this one here is not such a big project. Here's what it was started with. And, you know, to put some timbers in a post, you know, well, any village idiot can do that, right? So, you know, what can make this kind of really pop and add to the modern vibe? And what that was... And the, the one thing that was just kind of really playful and fun, you kind of see it here. You see this post, how it starts smaller? And then it, I'm going to exaggerate it. It angles up like that. So the post gets fatter at the top. It is somewhat practical in that it allows for some joinery here. This beam here, it tapers up. And... And then this overhang as well, it, it tapers and it comes out way a lot further here. So you get kind of this, clear this here. You get kind of this vibe where you've got this, this, this force or this energy or emphasis, kind of like, let's get, let's be happy. Let's, this is good. This is vibrant here. We, this is good stuff. And, uh, and then we'll mimic that three times. So we get that in three places with the corbels here supporting that. And, and it just really changes it. You just really get something that's valuable, that's gonna resonate. And it's just really, I don't know, that, that's, that's just a peek behind the scenes why modern has evolved to become my second favorite style all really good they all have real fine point good points but you know we have to make choices those are mine another point that's worth noting and again we've got this everything straight there's no extra frills there's no arches there's no no little cutouts like you'll see in craftsmen sometimes with beams and another point that's worth noting here just as a it, this is I tried to put stone here quite a bit, the different things and a post and different things right here, but it didn't really lock in. It was kind of like, it's, you know, you have to find that minimalist balance. That's the word for modern there. And so just going straight to the wall, let this kind of shine. I mean, it's just got this, you know, kind of that flow like this and that's, really consistent with what we've talked about with modern and sparse, not too much, the surprise. So, whoop, I've got to back up. So now we've got an attitude questionnaire, a little bit more introspection for you, okay? So you don't have to close your eyes, but you might, it might help you concentrate. I'm gonna read two, there's in the book, at the conclusion of section two, we've got seven attitude questionnaires and we've kind of built a conglomerate of different personalities and types of people. And it's not, of course, 100 percent. But I'm going to read you the two for rustic and modern. And I want you to listen to them. You're not going to agree with everything. But again, make a choice, just like the continuum we had at the front. OK. Oh, and this is the book, The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing, second edition. 
There's attitude questionnaire. There's a lot of fun. You chuckle with it. So example A, I'm a bit of a neat freak and I hate following the crowd. I find long-term long -term contentedness with bold decisions and unexpected design surprises. Example B, I wish I could live closer to nature without a cell phone. The stress, distractions, and hustle of modern life just might drive me to drinking. Pretty tough on that one, right? So that is your two continuums. Which one are you? And then here's kind of a summary of the two. Of course, we have rustic over here. So R for rustic, M for modern. And those are kind of two personalities on, on the extremes. You'll likely be somewhere, somewhere in the middle. You'll like some things about modern. You'll like some things about rustic. Okay, so one other piece here that I want to share with you is a question that we ask in our brainstorms. And so just I want you to, in your mind's eye, think about ideas you like or the project you've got in mind, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And I want you to just take a step back in your mind's eye and think the whole entire thing. What is the look and feel you're looking for? You're going to have carpets, cabinets, colors, textures, furniture, the whole thing, and of course, timbers are going to make a big impact. It will be hard to change later. So you want to try to get that right. But just in all, if we're looking at a rustic factor with 10 being a log cabin, maybe some antlers on the walls or antler chandelier, and one being a modern hospital, big glass, sleek surfaces, that sort of thing, what number just in general, what number kind of just pops out for you? Okay, write that down and hold on to that because that will help you decide how much timbers, what sizes, how frequently, frequently they should occur, and help you with other decisions you're going to be making when you're building. And then here's that rustic factor. Here's that rustic factor depicted as well. One with the, the modern and 10 with you know, the heavy log cabin. You can get 10 with timber framing. Most people tend to fall somewhere in here. But we've had a lot of fun down, down here. If we're, if we're getting below a three, you know, it, it's just a small package. You're not going to use a lot of wood in that, in that particular element. But I'm going to make a case for using wood. Okay. So let's talk about timber framing as a worthy goal. There's a lot worse pursuits we can do as far as how productive they are and how they make us feel and what they do for our family and what they do for our friends and so on and so forth. Of course, we, did, we all know that. But two things I'd like to talk about. One is what can you get from it? and how you can have fun with it. And the second is what wood itself as a building material, the benefits of, of using wood. So let's see here, do we wanna start out with, let's start out with the bigger one, which is how it's gonna make you feel, what you can do for having family gatherings, that sort of thing. It's a, it's a way to personalize, so if, if you, you might be, Thinking about timber frame, you might be just very curious. You may be well on your way and know all kinds of things that you want and don't want with timbers and your style. But anyway, you're, wherever you're at, the thing that's really cool about using wood and in particular exposed beams and timber framing to kind of create a statement is it can be as muted or grand as you want. It can be art on a big scale and it can really help resale value which is kind of minor, kind of minor. Builders have used our packages and they say they get like a 35 to a 50% return on the money they spend with us. In other words, if we can create that balance, that beauty, that pow, 
their houses sell faster and they make money off of it. So that could apply to what you're doing in your project. But I looked at it, I look at that as kind of a minor benefit. The bigger benefit is if we can capture you know, who you are and what you're about with how beams are kind of placed and balanced and designed and constructed, and you just feel good in that space and people come over and they say, wow, it's just kind of, it just, I just like being here. You know, that that's just worth a ton. And so that's kind of the big benefit of it. And then you can have fun with the decisions and all that provided you read section one of our book, get your head on straight. Really, you know, it doesn't have to come from our book. There's a lot of books on there out in the market that talk about figuring out what you're about and getting clarity. We've boiled it down to some simple, fast exercises because we know people are busy and they don't want to reinvent the wheel for everything they do. So that is the biggest reason to consider timber framing, acquiring timbers, having some fun with it as a worthy goal. The second one has to do with wood as a building, building material. So things have kind of come in a full circle. Way back in the day, it was wood. Stone was used as building like castles and that sort of thing, but they were drafty and damp and it wasn't ideal. People like wood. And we've done a lot of things now. Now we have three, three main building materials. We have concrete, steel, and wood. Those are the big three. So concrete and steel, there's a book out there called The New Carbon Architecture. And this book makes a really strong case for using wood to help with climate change. And in the book, they talk about how steel and concrete, the energy consumption to make concrete, to make steel, and what it does for climate change is has a really high cost, a really high cost, and it's not renewable. And so a lot of information about wood being renewable, it's, it's warm, it, it's easy, and then when the building's done, it takes less energy to use, you know, heat and cool because it's not transferring thermal bridging energy or warmth or, or coolness through the walls, through the roof. So that renewable resource also has one other aspect that I never really thought about until I'd read this book, The New Carbon Architecture, and it talks about carbon sequestering. Sequestering is a big word, but it just means that the carbon, if you're using wood, that is carbon that is not going to rot or burn. I'm a rot or burn, and it's going to be just kind of hold up there, safe, stored. And so it's not going out into the environment at the same rate as the carbon that's used to create, you know, concrete and steel. And I'm not saying that concrete and steel are the villains. I just think that if there's a choice, let's try to use wood a little more. There's a, there's a time and a place for concrete and steel, but that is going to just help out big. There's, there's a, what's called uh CLTs, cross-laminated timbers, and they're building big skyscrapers out of them. Like, I think they're up to 14 stories. And what they are is they're a bunch of like two by sixes that are cross-laminated and they build big walls. And that is the structure, the floor, the roof. It's a ton of wood. So there's a, there's a lot of carbon sequestering done there. But just say, for example, that you, you decide to do this, you pursue timber framing and you get done, you get this great space, it feels good, people come over and it's just, you know, you and your wife know life isn't perfect, but it's just something you've done together and you've created memories there. And it's just part of you and, and part of that stability. And then you can say, hey, you know, that look at how much carbon I've got sequestered up in those beams. Kind of fun, right? So there's my plug for timber framing. And, Let's talk about your bonus. With your bonus, you've got a choice, the book or the guide. 
Okay, what you want to do is you want to put in your in the chat your email. Actually, email. To oh, Lucas. I guess sorry. We want to just email to Lucas at arrowtimber.com. L, here I'll write it down here. L U C A S at arrow timber dot com now there's a funny little story with this book and we talked about wood coming in a full circle this book has really kind of come into a full circle so circle for me so many of you know 2002 i was a framing contractor a client asked me to do some timber framing and i said well what's timber framing and he talked about it. I said, let me think about it. I went to the library, found some books on timber framing, checked them out, read them, and did the project and kind of fell in love with it. Now my hope is, is that if somebody is in the library or on Amazon looking for things about timber framing, that if they stumble across this book, that this is going to help them as well. So it feels kind of cool. Now, this book is kind of one of a kind. It's not like the books I first read when I ran across my, my introduction to timber framing. Those were more technical about joinery and this, how things work and uh, history. This book has a pretty nice overview of the history as well as some joinery and different, different techniques. There's some technical aspects and communication things and tips for the construction side of things in, in, in section three, but it's really one of a kind in that it is about who are you, what do you want, and what timber frame style is going to just mm, resonate, just lock it in. So that's that's what this is about. You know, what do you want? You know, who are you? What do you want? And what style is best for you? So email lucas at aerotimber.com and we're going to send you one or the other and if for example this book resonates with you you get some help from it and you'd like to say thanks back there is no strings attached you can give us a review when this book is released it's going to be re released in about a month okay so moving on to the q and a Whew, which one do we want to take first? There's a lot of them here. I guess we'll go right down from the top, top down. So we see this, of course, we're attracted to opposites many times. So what if my style is different than my spouse's? I guess the short answer here is don't worry. You're going to find something that works for both of you. We'll take pieces and twists and find a balance. And there's other tricks as well, such as, like, say, for example, the guy just really wants some rustic stuff, but mama just doesn't like it so much. Well, sometimes we've seen where people will take a room and make it like a man cave or an office or a study, something like that, where they, where they can kind of get something that resonates with them. More often than not, we actually see people get surprised with what comes out of the process, the design process, something that they can both say, yeah, that works. And it just works for them. So it's, it's a collaborative effort. And it goes back to that creativity with more constraints. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So I wouldn't be too concerned about it if that's one of your questions. Okay, speaking the same language, this is a fairly common complaint. You, you may be trying to communicate and get your ideas across, and maybe the first designer you talk to, they kind of start or whatever, but it just doesn't seem to gel. It just don't seem to get what you're trying to do. So speaking the same language really has two parts. One is getting the words and pictures. So when you show a picture to me or any service provider, do we – understand enough about you to see what's important with that picture. And so there's words and vernacular that are in the book that we've done that would be pretty helpful in 
in getting on the same page with whoever you're going to communicate with. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is, is just good old listening and then gathering kind of an intuitive feel for what someone's trying to accomplish. And that we try to do, even if people don't come to us with a specific, clear, like we, here's the three words that define what we're trying to do. We try to feel those words in for ourselves and then test it by repeating back so that, so that we have kind of a decision compass. And this decision compass is in our book, how to build that decision compass is in chapter three. Okay, make decisions with more confidence. How can we do this? The answer, buy the book. Really, it's the, con the continuums. What do you say no to? Those exercises that we do have in the book are great to work with. You might have some that you've already used. But who are you? What are you going to say no to? What are you trying to achieve? Why are you trying to achieve it? Get those questions, get those questions locked in and you'll be able to make decisions with more confidence. If I was gonna just give you one exercise to make decisions with more confidence, make a list. What am I saying no to? Boom, boom, boom. And what you'll find out is you might make your list and then decide that, well, down here, this one here, you don't know if you can say no to that. Well, you might add it to the yes, but by default, you're going to have to throw in another no. But that is probably the, by far the biggest confidence builder for decisions that I could ever recommend. Okay, so you may, you may have taken our style quiz online. It probably takes about three minutes. And I'm not going to say that it's perfect, but it's a great start. And that you might get your results and you might be 12% this, 15% that, and never really a clear percentage in one category, just all over the map. What if you're all over the map with your style? Not a problem. You're unique and this is just you. And the process will get you something that you really like. That I can I can say it with a high degree of confidence because if the process is followed, if we don't rush it, it works. You'll get something that really resonates and that you like. Are there other popular timbers frame styles? Yes, there are five of them. We have not covered the other five. They are in the book. You've got classic, craftsman. Traditional, classic craftsman, traditional, coastal, and there's one more, seven the tall number, European. Yep. So those are the other five. And we've seen there's mix and match all the way around. The big thing about delineating these seven styles is it really gives a shortcut for people figuring out what they want. They can say, well, I like a little bit of European, but mostly want to focus on this. And even if that test turns out bad, we've got there in a hurry. We can back off and try some other stuff. So there's five other styles in the book. So this is a common complaint. How do I get an answer without uncovering five questions? So many times people come in and I got to tell them that, you know, just settle down, you know, and, and the common complaint might come out something like this. Like, oh, we're already three months into this thing. I want to be building already. Yeah, really mad about it. And, you know, until things are squared away in all the decision makers' heads, it's going to be a grind. It's going to be a grind. So the big questions, why are you doing it? What are you trying to achieve? What are you willing to say no to? Uh, and then there's even hiring things. Who to hire? That a little quick exercise on how to figure out who to hire as well in, in chapter five. But all these big questions are what slows that process up and 
and to tell someone, well, let's just make a decision and go, that, that could be risking 500,000, 800,000, a million, 2 million. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of marbles in play here. So you want to kind of do due diligence and give a good effort to get it right. Get it right, do it for the right things and for the right reasons. Okay, and then which style is best for me? I kind of think we've answered that. It's introspection, knowing the big questions, and then following the process. Pretty simple. And do that, you'll get it right. And then does your builder speak your language? Kind of circles back to this question that does he get what I'm saying? Does so-and-so get what I'm trying to say? Can are they you know, all their ideas aren't going to be just 100%, but in general, are they driving in a direction that resonates, that feels like you're moving forward, and it's not like, oh, I don't want that at all. There's some of that, but in general, that's what you're looking for. And I think that we have covered a lot for you today. Appreciate you being here with us, and I look forward to the next one with you. Email to Lucas. At and remember, just email to Lucas at arrowtimber.com for your book or planning guide.